Hey, fearsome friends. Long time no listen. I apologize for the lack of videos. Tonight I've got a great selection of stories from Reddit. So sit back, relax, and get cozy, comfy, warm. Because it's time to let your nightmares in. It was summer and I was 15 when I found a job in a local newspaper for a live-in babysitter. I wanted to make some money and I lived in a rural area so I didn't have transportation to get to a mall or fast food place to work which where the usual jobs for teens are. There was no public transportation where I lived and no jobs in the rural town I lived in so this was a great find. I called the number for the live-in babysitting job and a man answered. I found out that he was divorced with two young children and they were elementary school age and were home for summer vacation so he needed someone to watch them while he was at work. He spoke to my mother on the phone and she agreed to allow me to do the live-in job. Now as an adult I questioned so many of her decisions and definitely this one. He picked me up and drove me to his house and on the way he told me that he was engaged. He said that his fiancée was his former babysitter and she was a few years older than I was. As a 15 year old this didn't set off any alarm bells. I just thought it was weird that someone my age would want to be with an older man. He was probably in his late 30s to mid 40s. I also thought it was weird when I was taking the children for a walk and a woman who lived in the neighborhood looked at me in an odd way, like something was wrong about me walking with those children. When I smiled and waved, she just looked away and ignored me. I didn't give it a lot of thought though, it just seemed strange. The house was split level with the main living area and the bedrooms on the top level, and the lower level just had a living room area and a single bedroom, which was my assigned room. Not long after I began living in there to babysit for this guy, he knocked on my bedroom door after I had gone to bed. I was kind of freaked out by this, so I opened the door partially to ask what he wanted. He acted all friendly and asked me if I wanted a beer like he was cool with that. I simply said no and waited for him to leave and shut the door. The next day I told him that I no longer wanted to work for him and had him take me back home. I didn't fully understand at the time that he was a predator who was trying to groom me into having a relationship with him but I knew enough to know that something just wasn't right about the situation, that he was creepy and something told me to get out of there. I asked my mother who was now 80 years old if she remembered this happening and she did. She said the man had a 19 year old fiance so I asked her why she'd let me do this and she said that she wrote a handwritten contract that he'd signed which said he would put a lock on my bedroom door and that I could leave at any time I wanted to. I know, her judgement was very wrong to allow me to do this. I'm just relating what she told me when I asked her a few days ago. She said that I told her when I returned home, that when he knocked on my door that night, he'd asked if I wanted to have a steak and a beer with him. I had forgotten about the steak detail, but I remember that now. She didn't remember his name, where he lived, or any other details though. This happened to me last night and it was so bizarre I need to share it. Early yesterday evening I was at my friend Jason's house chilling out and playing board games and it was getting late so I decided to head home as I'd told my wife I'd be back by 11. As I left his house and started to walk to my car down the street, I noticed a woman crouched down by my driver's side door. It was very dark out, so the most I could identify was that she was maybe in her late 50s, heavy set and wearing a pale t-shirt. As I got a bit closer, thinking that maybe she dropped her own car keys, she suddenly stood up and looked me dead in the eyes. And without breaking eye contact, she asked me, Is this your car? To which I responded, Yeah. Thought so, she said, still not breaking eye contact. 
I don't know what she meant by that, as I'd never seen her before in my life. So obviously I was a bit confused, and was about to ask her what she meant, when she suddenly shouted, Gimme, 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 a man after midnight. I didn't know what to say. I just stood there completely dumbfounded, when she turned and walked off, as casual as anything, like nothing had happened. At this point I had written it off as just another weird encounter, so I unlocked my car, got in, locked the doors and started the engine. Then through my rearview mirror, I saw her again, now visible with my red rear back lights. I could see her stood behind the car behind mine, watching me, fixated on me. Now I'm not usually a nervous person, I'm a pretty big guy and know how to handle myself. But something about the way she was looking at me made me shiver. I pulled away from the curb and drove off as quickly as I could. But something felt wrong. I couldn't tell what at first, but something wasn't right with my car. Then I realised both of my wing mirrors were pointed downwards and I couldn't see a thing through them. Luckily I managed to find somewhere safe to pull over and fix them. But driving in almost complete darkness without them shook me up pretty badly. I'm going to abstain from giving too much information, because this stalker scares the crap out of me. Thankfully he doesn't read English though, so I hope he'll never find this post. Years ago, I moved to be with my boyfriend and do a PhD in his country. I won't name the place, but it's an across the ocean type of deal, and at first I was very excited. It was a wonderful adventure, until of course it wasn't. It's hard to describe the complexity of what I felt, but I felt alone, misunderstood, far from my family and friends, and even though my boyfriend is wonderful. I really felt the weight of not finding any human connection. This could explain why I acted so weird and disconnected from reality during the following incident. I'm a very naive woman, and I like to see the best in people, but this has been a problem for me more than a few times. This story is maybe the worst example of where this candid attitude got me. So my boyfriend and I are into BDSM. We do it alone, or on our own, and don't participate in events or anything like that, but I do have an account on a known BDSM website. I go there to find new ideas for our sessions, and I sometimes, but rarely, post pictures, with no face or tattoos, etc., and I get contacted by interesting doms once in a while, even though I clearly state I'm not free. Usually they send copy-paste messages, so I just ignore them. Once in a while though, I'd get a more personal message, and make an effort to answer that I'm not interested, and that I'm in a relationship. So this is how my discussion with Nick started. He didn't approach me with a, will you be my sub, but with curiosity about how I got into BDSM, stating he was quite new to the domain, and was interested in understanding the way of life. So I gladly explained, and these explanations turned into discussions, he told me he was in the police, and that he investigated drug cartels. He also told me he was married and that he had kids. And interestingly, we had a lot of hobbies in common. I won't go into details about those hobbies, but they're kind of specific. So feeling very lonely, combined with the fact that I felt I could trust him because he was married and had kids, I accepted his invitation to start texting on WhatsApp. Now I want to be clear. My boyfriend knew about this from day one. Plus we had been talking on this website for almost three months before switching to WhatsApp. He was very friendly and interested by my day-to-day -day life, and he'd share pictures of his kids and of investigations he was working on. This went on for another three months, when one day he told me he had to interview a suspect close to the town where I lived and asked if we could meet for a coffee. I agreed and we met for the first time. Now before anyone panics, my boyfriend was hiking with friends for a few weeks and I texted him about this, 
but he didn't have a signal. Plus, we have a very trusting relationship. He has a lot of girlfriends. And back in my country, I hung out with a lot of boys. This isn't weird for us. So now, back to the first encounter. It felt as if we had known each other for years. We had a great time from the beginning, and I was so happy I'd found a friend far from my country. I knew he loved reading thrillers and enjoyed murder investigation videos, so he showed me his police gear, handcuffs, sampling kits for small investigations, and other restraints, etc. It didn't feel weird in the moment, but afterwards I kind of understood this could have been a way for him to show off. However, as the night went on, after grabbing drinks from a nearby bar, he forced me against a wall and kissed me. I was shocked and barely managed to push him off me. I told him it was inappropriate as he was married and that I was in a relationship, so he was really sorry and said he felt ashamed. He told me he felt there was something between us, and I said, yeah, it's called friendship. I was disappointed in him and we parted ways. Days later, after he'd apologized over and over again and called me to meet up, he wanted to take me for a ride around his hometown and it's a pretty place. He's got a bike and wanted me to enjoy the scenery in this country that I barely knew, and I agreed. It's his hometown, he works there, and lives there with his wife and kids, so surely I'll be safe. I wasn't. He tried to kiss me again and pushed for more whilst in the middle of a park, a park where he brought his children to play on the weekends. I told him to take me back to the bus station so I could leave, which he did. Then he proceeded to tell me a story about how he had recently gotten a drug dealer out of hiding by modifying texts sent by his girlfriend. He'd basically made him believe she was cheating on him to get him to confront her and then arrested him. I don't know if it's true and I don't know if it's even possible, but due to what had just happened, what I heard was, I can make your boyfriend believe you're cheating on him and my boyfriend was still on his hike at the time. We talked once every few days, and I told him everything that was going on from the moment he had some cell signal, and confronted Nick about that. His behaviour was really strange though from then on, as he'd gone from, I'm sorry, I think I'm in love with you, to, if you tell the cops, who do you think they'll believe, their colleague or an immigrant? I got scared and tried to cool things down with him at that point, as I felt he could lose it at any moment. He clearly wasn't used to girls refusing him, and by then I thought it would be safer for me and my boyfriend to maintain contact with Nick, albeit with less enthusiasm than before. But after understanding how obsessed he actually was, I blocked him from all online platforms where I knew he had an account. But he found me. He sent me my address, asking if I loved living in that particular part of town but I never gave him my address. I guess he was able to pull some strings at the station to get my info, and he even came to visit me at my job. I was so scared I just acted as if everything was okay. I told him my boyfriend wanted me to cut ties with him, because he was angry about what had happened, which was true, but I also wanted him out of my life. I didn't know how he'd react if I told him this, however. Nick insisted that I loved him, that I could be his mistress, and that my boyfriend didn't have to know. He was obsessed with me, and he didn't hide it anymore. He told me how he wanted to have sex with me, how we'd be a great couple, and how he'd father our kids. And he went from, I'll be husband material, to serial rapist in a matter of seconds. I refused again and again, blocking him and changing my accounts, etc. I got scared when I got calls from unknown numbers, and was terrified when I saw anyone slowing down on a motorcycle close to my apartment. I was wary of going outside and going to work, so when Covid hit, the quarantine was welcomed from me, because it meant I didn't get any news from him for months. And then I broke my cell phone. I knew I could transfer all my numbers from one phone to the other, but I didn't know it would unblock previously blocked numbers. Days later, I got a message from him telling me he had divorced his wife and that he still loved me and wanted to marry me. 
He apologised for making me believe I was only mistress material, and that I was worth so much more. He said my boyfriend didn't love me, that I deserved better, and that he was waiting for me. When he saw that I'd seen this message, he said, Finally, I thought you'd never unblock me. Does this mean he had been sending this message over and over again in hopes I'd finally see it? That narcissist used all the manipulation tactics he knew. He had told me before we met in person how he had learned those skills to toy with criminals, to have them tell the truth and admit to crimes. But fortunately, I had dated manipulative men before and knew the signs. Basically, he wasn't used to not getting what he wanted. He was attractive rich, interesting, but he knew it. I blocked him again and we moved a few months later. I just hope he doesn't get his hand on this information. I believe Nick's last move was trying to hack into my Instagram as I got a notification that someone from his hometown had tried to connect to my account. So I work in a small hospital in a small city. It's no more than a 10 minute walk for me to get there, but I can do it in six minutes on my way in and 10 minutes on the way home because it's up a big hill. I often work evenings and my shift ends at 11.30 p.m. Though if there's something particular going on, we stay later to finish. I've had mornings where I sauntered home at 3 a.m. and never saw a soul. I also live adjacent to a rougher part of town that's got a lot of subsidised housing and is well known for violent crime and substance abuse. Co-workers often offer to give me a lift and tell me I shouldn't be walking past that street. But I always say, I've never had a bad experience and it's only ten minutes. So it was about midnight and one of my co-workers had offered to drive me home. But it was a nice evening, clear and cool. It's only 10 minutes up over the hill, right? The first part of my walk was uneventful, until I passed the intersection that led to the rough part, and suddenly there was a guy following me from behind the hedgerow at the corner. I've no idea where he came from, but it must have been the rough area. It was dark, so I couldn't see him, but he was maybe my height, 5'8", and a little heavier than me, wearing a black hoodie with the hood up, so I couldn't see his face. I walked faster, he walked faster, and by the time I hit the convenience store a half a block from my house, I was basically speed walking and he was half jogging to keep up. I put on even more speed and round the corner onto my street and I did the old keys in the fist thing too. What was this guy doing? Was he going to grab me, assault me, hurt me? My mind was racing. I got three houses up my street before I looked back, and he was standing there under the street light, hood up, arms at his sides, breathing heavy and staring in my direction. It scared the crap out of me. I went up past the house as a precaution, and once I saw him retreat, I went back down the block to my house. I didn't want him to see where I lived, and my husband doesn't let me walk home from night shifts anymore and thankfully I've not had an experience like it since. So full disclosure, I don't think this is anything other than a bunch of crazy coincidence in a setting that made it more weird, but I will definitely never forget it. When I was depressed, one of the things I had a lot of issues with was my dreams. I would have a very intense, vivid dream one night, and then the next night it picked up where it left off. This went on for months. The dreams had a lot of imagery related to my family and country of origin during World War II, and I believed they meant something. The only people who knew this dream fascination were my husband and my therapist. So, to the hospital. There was one guy there, let's call him Dave, who had schizophrenia. He was kind, honest, interesting and very talkative. 
Unfortunately, he would go into these deep conspiracy wormholes, and you really just couldn't not be completely confused and tune out for a while. Most people just walked away from him, actually. But I told Dave outright that I usually got lost and tuned out. But if he just wanted to talk at me rather than to me, it was fine. So he did that. Now one evening, when I felt particularly crappy, I sat inside to draw alone. He came to sit with me and I said, Sorry mate, not this evening. And he understood. But he said, You know, very few people have been in the room with the Mona Lisa. And people who have are changed forever. They see things others don't. Then he walked away. What he didn't know though is, that I am one such person. Long story short, I got to the Louvre on, on closing, and begged the ticket person to let me in. As I got to the room the Mona Lisa was in, security was ushering people out the exit, so I went in there alone. I'd never thought a painting could be special, but there was something eerie about being alone with it. So as you'd imagine, this random but oddly specific comment from my friend Dave creeped me out a little. He came back about 15 minutes later as I was getting ready to go up to my room and handed me a folded piece of paper and said, You don't have to read it now. It's just something I think you should look into. Then he left. So I stuffed it into my drawing pad and went upstairs. Once in my room, my husband rang me excited. He'd been watching a documentary about genetic memories coming through dreams and it was about some women living in two different countries who were being treated by two different psychiatrists. They'd had vivid dreams they were Cathars, medieval religious sect, and he told me all about the phenomenon and the possibility that we could inherit memories through inherit DNA. Some kind of genetic testing showed the women were related to each other and also likely descendants of the Cathars. Well, I thought this was pretty cool, and being unwell felt validated that my dreams might actually mean something that they were inherited memories from my grandparents. In any case, we said goodnight and I got ready to go to sleep. I went to move my drawing pad off the bed then, and the paper Dave gave me half an hour earlier slipped out onto the floor. I picked it up and opened it to see what he'd written inside, and it read, The Cathars. Keep in mind there was no TV in the facility, and I could see Dave outside through the grass the whole time I was in the dining room drawing. It was about an hour and a half and couldn't go upstairs without walking past me. There's little to no probability that he had been watching the same documentary as my husband. He just... well, I don't know. It really truly freaked me out at the time. I didn't think he could read my mind or was psychic. I just wondered if his mental illness gave him some kind of insight that was often mistaken for delusion. Perhaps I still do in some ways. When I left the hospital, Dave had my number, but I didn't hear from him for months. Until one evening, when my now ex-husband and I were talking about this Cathars incident for the first time since I got home, about how bizarre and unexplainable it seemed to be. And then my phone rang. It was Dave. I don't know where he is now, and this was a long time ago, but I sometimes wish I did, and I hope he's doing okay. I'd like to preface this with a little info on this guy Marcus. Marcus and I went to high school together but I don't really remember us having this insanely powerful friendship or whatever. He was actually only around for two of the four years, as he'd moved out of district during our sophomore year. He continued going for about half the year before it was found out by higher-ups that he wasn't in his own district, and they essentially kicked him out to go to a more local high school. I'm not sure of the laws or why that's even an issue, but I digress. Before he left, we hung out way less than I hung out with pretty much every other friend I had. He was nice and all, but we just didn't have that strong of a connection. I do recall us dating for a very short while after he'd asked me out. 
but I was already at a point in my life where I was cognizant of my inability to form strong attachments to people and let him know right off the bat that I'm willing to give it a shot, but based on past trends, I really don't think it's going to go anywhere. And to prevent any potential delay of the inevitable, I'll let you know after a week how it's going. And I did, and it didn't go anywhere. I broke it off ASAP and didn't want there to be any chance of my leading him on because it's happened to me more times than I can count, and I know how crappy that feels. I've since then begun to transition into male, and we chatted every few months or so via telephone conversation, but they were always super surface level, and never really felt like true conversations. I feel like a lot of it actually was talking about my medical problems, but I don't have the old texts to be exactly sure of what they were about. So one day, I decided that this wasn't really a good friendship. Not because either of us had done anything wrong, but I just really don't feel like trying to force a friendship to stay alive that's barely hanging on by a thread. We hadn't seen each other in years, and only texted once every five months or so. So I let them hit dead air, assuming that eventually he'd get bored of trying to keep it alive after a bit and move on. A few months went by with nothing, then another checkup text came in. I gave dead air, as again didn't want to lead him on, a friendship that wasn't possible, and not saying anything seemed like the gentlest way of doing that, rather than, I'm just not friends with you anymore, leave me be. A few more months went by then, and I got another checkup text. Over and over and over this happened, and I shit you not, this continued for five and a half years, with every few months a little checkup. They were never insane or anything. It was just a, you're so special and you're a wonderful person kind of stuff. Which, fair enough, I do get depressed sometimes. But this was weird. I was happy to let that just be a thing. If texting me every few months without a response is working for this guy, who am I to judge? It's really none of my business. So I left him to it for years. It really wasn't that concerning. Until I change numbers, that is. I changed my number recently, because long story short, my parents were still paying for the old one, and I wanted to be more independent. So I got a brand new number and carrier, which was a breath of fresh air, because that old number was ancient, and had definitely gotten sold on some website. Because I'd get five plus texts a day spamming me with penis pills, and all that good stuff, so it was nice to actually be able to trust that a message was indeed a message, and not another wow your honey spam. However, I'd only had this new number for a month before Marcus showed up on my Tumblr account and DM'd me there when he had never done so in the past. I didn't even know that he had that Tumblr account, but it was an old reused one from senior year, so I gave it the pass that maybe I'd given it to him years ago and just can't remember that far. But interestingly enough, it wasn't following me. So a degree, it seemed as though there was an attempt to hide. Again, I left it on red, as I'd come this far, and at this point I was kind of getting a little freaked out. I don't really remember publicly posting that I'd gotten a new phone number, just that I had to change carriers. To my knowledge, the old number was still in service, so texting it should have the same result of just no response, I thought. So how on earth did he get that knowledge so damn fast? I could have dropped it there, and I'd gone to school for forensics investigation, as I generally have a pretty good idea on how to keep these types of guys at an arm's reach, allowing them to think they're being sneaky when they've been very clearly caught so they don't attempt to hide any further. But I got a text the other day from a number I didn't recognise that said nothing but, please text me. I literally have only given this number to my boyfriend and sister, and nobody else. Everyone is aware of Marcus, and finds him creepy too. And we have a history of having stalkers in my family, because my mum's side has really bad BPD. And that type of personality tends to create trauma bond relationships, which very easily turn into stalking, because the other is so dependent. But I'm aware of those circumstances, and made every effort to avoid doing that myself. I'm also the only one in the family with therapy. My boyfriend and I met in college, we are both FTM, and I'm very, very gay in this way. 
Even if I wasn't currently dating my boyfriend, I wouldn't be dating a biological male, and I'm also asexual and have no interest in anything beyond a romantic relationship. Since my boyfriend and I met in college, he has never even met Marcus, but I really don't think that even matters. Because again, everyone in my family is in agreement that Marcus is a little off, to say the least. I'm writing here because I'm honestly kind of getting worried. I'm not physically afraid of this guy. Again, forensics major. I know how to protect and defend myself. Not to mention my mum has a guard dog that weighs more than me and would happily tear the throat out of anybody we so much as say help to. So in essence, I'm not scared of this dude showing up. If the dog doesn't eat him, then he'll have a lot of fun with my taser, as well as the other two dogs in this house. And if that doesn't work, I'll just start throwing cats at him. They aren't short in supply in this house. And let me tell you, I have the sweetest little baby, but if you make an ounce of a sudden movement, that bitch's fingers turn into police spikes, and she will rip every ounce of you up in an effort to run away. What I'd like to know is, is there a reliable phone number lookup service out there so I can figure out for certain who the hell this number is? Because if it isn't Marcus, I'd be relieved but confused. If it is Marcus, then I honestly want to know if that number is attached to his parents or something, as maybe I could contact them and let them know what the juice is, because this is kind of getting a little sketchy. If I've got to restart my entire online persona again, I guess I can, but I really don't want to have to do that. I have the biggest following for my art than ever before in my life, and I'll miss it. As God is my witness, this is a true story, and I'm not making it up. I'm 57 years old now, and this is a memory that never goes away. In 1986, I stopped in Topeka, Kansas, on my way back from working in Yellowstone National Park for the summer. My friend had also just graduated from high school a few years before, and had moved to Topeka with his parents. I stayed about a week and his parents invited me to stay an extra day for their family reunion before I headed back home. We drove way out into the country for it, in his old beta car, and spent all day with his extended family. In the late afternoon, we made our way back to Topeka in his old car that had a broken gas gauge, and we ran out of gas. He said we were probably six to seven miles from the nearest gas station, and this was pre-cell phone, so we were trying to figure out what to do when suddenly a van with no windows pulled over and asked us if we needed help. When you're young, you think these things just miraculously happen for you, but when you're older, you know better. We told him we'd run out of gas, and the friendly enough man offered to take us to the nearest station. We then got in the van to discover that there were a total of three men in the vehicle. There were no seats in the back, and so we had to just sit on the floor of what appeared to be a work-type, beat-up, older model white van. However, just then, we clearly heard the men discussing doing us harm. The driver said he knew a good place to go, and the other man in the passenger seat, who was eyeing me, agreed that he was in and nodded approval. Only one man, sitting nearest us, said he wasn't in and didn't want to be involved in it at all. He explained he had a baby now, and he's not cool with it. The driver and passenger seat rider said something under their breaths that I couldn't hear, and there was an angry silence whilst the driver thought it all over. In my mind, I prayed one word. Help. My head felt like I was stuttering thoughts. Part of me was in denial, another part in shock. But fear hadn't set in yet. Just like a jolt to the system of an unreal horror happening to someone else, because an hour ago I was completely safe without a care in the world. And now the absurd idea of someone raping me. Yes, I was acutely aware raping me and murdering us were both what they would do. Then leaving us somewhere nobody would find us was flipping through my mind. Have you ever been to Kansas? There's lots of lonely, godforsaken, desolate roads to nowhere. If, at this point, the third guy had changed his mind, or simply said just let him out first, 
I don't think I would be sharing this with you right now. They'd stopped talking to each other and hadn't spoken to us at all from the moment we entered the van. My friend and I didn't speak to each other, and we barely looked at each other. We were petrified. I could hear the clanging rattle trap van's noises and the tyres on the road, and I saw my friend flexing, as if to warn he would fight to defend himself, whilst they were discussing where they would take us. Everything felt surreal, but the guy in the back, the guy that said no, and just like that the driver pulled over and the guy in the back opened up the side door, let us out and it was over. The air smelled somehow fragile and tainted, and the ground looked different, like I couldn't quite trust it. My friend looked as shaken as I felt, and we had survived a close encounter with shark-like predators, the blackest, darkest evil. I looked at the gas station in the late afternoon waning sunset, just before dark, and that gas station had transformed itself into a beacon of shining light, a safe haven of shelter and safety, and I knew once we got there, there was no way I would walk back to the car. The white van with no windows, pulling away from us felt surreal, like looking at it might give it the power to suck us up in its vacuum of ill intent. Today I can still see that van pulling away, a sort of mirage from a nightmare that had crossed over into my waking reality. At the time this story takes place, I was around 16 or 17 I think. It took place in the square of my hometown so basically the town centre. The first time I saw it happen, it was midsummer around 8pm at night, and still light out. That summer I spent hardly any time at home, and I was always out with friends, and we would crash at each other's houses. My friend lived a short walk from the supermarket, so the three of us went for a wander after deciding that we needed junk food after already eating dinner. We crossed the square, and there were a few people hanging about, so it wasn't empty but it wasn't crazy busy either. There was a rough looking man sitting on a bench reading a newspaper and he was eyeing up the other people in the square. I don't really know how to describe it, but from memory he was definitely paying attention to everyone there and watching their movements, probably so he didn't get caught. To get to the direction of the supermarket, we had to walk right past him quite closely and as the three of us walked past, I remember hearing an odd noise. We were walking three across, and I was on the outside, closest to the man, so I was the only one who heard this noise. I looked around after hearing it, and the guy was looking straight at me. I made full-on eye contact with him, and then, just out of my field of vision, I could see movement. I still didn't grasp what was happening, so when I looked down, I noticed that there were rapid movements behind the newspaper. I can remember making a disgusted face, and the guy just laughed at me. My friends had walked a few steps ahead of me by this stage, so I had to run to catch up. It wasn't until we got to the supermarket, and I thought on it more, that I realised he was masturbating behind the newspaper. The shock had worn off by that stage, and I knew what he had been doing. I told my friends and they were creeped out, so we debated calling the non-emergency police number or just notifying anyone. But my other friend said that as he hadn't touched me or anyone else, it wasn't a crime. So basically, we didn't know if there was a reason to call the police, because we were unsure if he had broken any laws. He wasn't there by the time we walked back across the square, so it was deemed not a big deal by the others, and I soon forgot about the incident, putting it down to a gross man being gross sort of thing. I did tell someone else about it, but he really downplayed it, and told me that when men get horny, they can't control it, so they just have to crank one out. At the age of 26 now, and thinking back to him telling me that, I feel disgusted, because that is so not the case. A few months later after school, I was in town and meeting up with a friend in the square. It was after three o'clock, and it was quite busy as school was out, and he was there again, on the same bench, doing the same thing. I was on the other side of the square, 
but I could see rapid movements behind the newspaper, and I just knew what he was doing. I was concerned, because there were other school-age kids around, a lot of them younger than me, meeting up or waiting in the square for people, as it was a thing that a lot of teenagers did after school. What was to stop him from flashing them, or worse, trying to coerce someone into something, or going somewhere with him, or go after them? In my mind, if he could do that in front of teens and preteens, then there wasn't much stopping him from doing worse. What was to say he wouldn't try and snatch someone? I had my phone ready to go, but thankfully, a middle-aged woman noticed. She went over to the group of girls closest to him, and quietly moved them away. She did it really well too. She didn't scream or anything when she saw the man doing what he was doing. She just went up to them quietly, said something to them and moved them away. Then she got her phone out. I guess when he saw the woman on her phone, he sent something was up, because he left rather quickly, running off in another direction. Some of the other people weren't aware of what he had been doing, so they just figured he was some goon running through town. The police showed up soon after the lady had called, and I had hung around so I could tell them I'd seen the guy a few months earlier. I never saw him again, but for ages afterwards there was a local PSA out warning people about the guy, and if they saw him, who to call. I shudder to think of anything potentially happening, but even if the dude was just a creep, it's never a good thing to be masturbating in public, especially when teenagers are around. If he couldn't stop himself from doing that, or couldn't control that urge, then I hate to think of what else he could have done. Back when I was in college and I'd finally gotten my own car, my usual Friday nights were taking my cousins and my brother to my old high school's football games, since we were all fans of the sport. The games would usually end by 9.30 in the evening, and after we got done with our late night fast food joint run, the time would be 10.30pm. Now whenever I dropped someone off at their house, regardless of what time of the day it was or how much of a rush I was in to go somewhere, I always made sure to sit in my car to wait until I saw them enter their house. My mum and dad were the ones who always engraved this in my head, because doing this ensured that they actually got home safely. My mum's fears were that they didn't have a key to get inside, and they were locked out of their own home. Or far worse, there was someone menacingly hiding behind the bushes, or against the wall far out of sight. So the time was around 10.30, and I pulled up to my last cousin's house. The passenger side of my car that my cousin was sitting in was facing directly in front of his house's driveway. So as my cousin was gathering his stuff, I glanced over to my aunt's house to see if there was anything or anyone around. And that's when I saw my uncle was underneath my aunt's car doing some work. Or so I thought. Before my cousin stepped out of the car, I took a closer look, and I now know that this man was not my uncle. I pulled my cousin back into the car and said, Look, who is that? He was frightened at just seeing this, and I told him to call his dad to make sure that this wasn't him. Just as he did so, I pulled the car to the other side of the street, just in case things went bad, and his dad came out as fast as he could, as did I, and now he and I were confronting the man underneath my aunt's car. He was way underneath it as his legs were the only part sticking out, but it just turned out to be a homeless man who'd had a few drinks, as he was slurring his words as we kept on trying to tell him that he needed to leave. I know that the man meant no harm, but I tell this story to people as a cautionary tale on why you should always make sure to scan the area and wait for your family members, friends, or whoever you are dropping off, to make sure that they enter their house safely. I'm a 38-year-old woman, and this happened to me Sunday night. My two friends, both women aged 37 and 33 and I, took a quick road trip to a nearby city for an impromptu end-of-summer ladies' night. We booked a nice hotel, 
got dinner and went to an emo night, which subsequently made us feel like the oldest humans on earth. But overall, it was a great time. We returned to our hotel room around 12.45am, and me and my one friend, we'll call her Marie, changed into our PJs, whilst our other friend, we'll call her Rachel, left the room to go outside to have a smoke and find forks so that we could eat our dinner leftovers. Marie and I were talking and laughing. I was mildly buzzed and Marie doesn't drink, and we were eating snacks whilst we waited for Rachel to return. We played a few songs on the room's Bluetooth radio, at what I would consider a reasonable volume. It was no louder than if we had been watching TV. And by the time Rachel had returned with plastic forks and tales of her run-in with the hotel robot, we had already turned the music off. At around 1.15ish, there was a knock on our door, which alarmed us, since we weren't expecting anyone. So Rachel looked through the peephole and saw a man wearing a face mask. She didn't recognise him, and we told her not to answer, since he didn't announce himself, and he thankfully left after a minute, and we assumed he had just gotten the wrong room. However, fifteen minutes later, there was another knock on the door, and this time it was much louder and aggressive. Startled, I stay put on my bed whilst Marie and Rachel both approached the peephole and saw the man from earlier. This time he was accompanied by a second man. Rachel and Marie waited a moment, and the men knocked again loudly and aggressively, without announcing themselves. At this point, Marie asked from behind our closed door if she could help them with anything. Then the second man yelled for her to let him into the room, and she replied that she didn't feel comfortable letting someone she didn't know into our room, and he yelled again for her to open the door. At this point, we were all really rattled, but Marie maintained a level head and asked if he was hotel staff. He said that he was, but she told him that she was still not comfortable opening the door for him. Then he again demanded she let him in. The first man then flashed a badge and said he was a hotel security. So she cracked the door with the security bar engaged, and asked what was going on. The second man informed her that they had reason to believe we were over occupancy, which was certainly not the case. There was just three of us in a double room, which has an occupancy for four adults. And the front desk knew there were three of us when we checked in, because they'd issued us each a key. He was incredibly rude and told us that if, if they had any more complaints, this was our only warning. She said okay and closed the door, and the two men presumably left. At this point we were super confused, which led us to feeling angry, and ultimately creeped out. Luckily that was the extent of our encounter, but it left us on edge for the rest of the night, and I have so many questions. What hotel staff knocks on a door and doesn't announce who they are or what their intentions are? If there was a noise complaint, why would they not have just called up to our room? And which was it? A noise complaint or a suspicion that we were over occupancy? I truly cannot imagine that Marie and me talking and giggling could be confused for a raging party. This morning we informed the front desk staff of our encounter, and they seemed horrified and apologised profusely, but it still just isn't sitting right with me. The best case scenario would be that the hotel's night staff and security was wildly undertrained, and I don't even want to think about the worst case scenario. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? It's just so weird. Three days ago, my old man went out of town, and on the first night, I heard what I assumed to be a large critter. As of 4.13am when I posted this, I thought they were gone for good. I wanted to say I'm glad they left, or knew I was armed, and not worth dying for or killing, but two nights ago, I was awoken by my dog between 11pm and 3am. He kept near me when I got up, and made a low aggressive growl facing out of my room. But the creepy thing is, he had never done this before. I've worked with canines for years, and this gave me a gut feeling. Then I heard it. Someone talking. In my yard, and no more than twenty feet away, was a low mumbling, whispering sound. 
I need to add here that I have childlike hearing for my age. So for context, that means if you speak in a one-floor house with two doors closed at a whisper, I can still make out words. He went quiet when I opened a drawer too loudly to grab my hidden 380, and I chambered around when I noticed a shadow passing by a light outside the blackout curtained window. Everything was clear, all doors were locked, and there was nothing odd, but my dog peeled out. I held my flashlight in one hand and went his way and called him to the other side, but he was gone. I guess they knew I was home and ran on foot. I carried on checking everything, but thought, okay, I'm good. Florida continues to be Florida. Night two came and my dog did this again in the same time frame, waking me up somewhere between 11 to 3 a.m. At this rate, I just got the 12 gauge, and my dog was acting far more protective this time, giving me the dog body language for major threat, need the pack, can't handle alone. I froze for a moment. Two people now. This isn't good. They must intend to violently take whatever they could be after. It was now two guys. I couldn't risk getting a look, as at this rate they meant business and had to be armed to scope out a place with a ring, 600 pounds plus of muscle dog, and my grown ass with a lifetime of handling guns. In the yard around 2.30 a.m., for a second night, they knew I and my dog was home, but clearly had a goal. This time, voices were behind the house. My dog then pulled a Leroy Jenkins and gave one of the most aggressive, loud barks I have ever heard any dog do and ran over to the wall. I ran to his side and yelled, Mess them up, they're dead men. Now it was all clicking into place for me. This was planned and professionally so. I checked every inch of the property with the shotgun, and my dog was worked up and spooked, but beginning to calm down. I'm buying him steak for this one, and a good one. I went inside and literally kept the gun on me, chambered and in reach of my bed, and I barely slept. Day three and I did a bit of looking around for misplaced or slightly moved objects or scratched locks. And yep, one trash can by the gate had been rotated 180 degrees, with the handle facing me, not to the wall, as it's always placed. There were a few crushed dead twigs as I went back, and the head chair was turned and moved to the right, which was a clearly odd thing as that table set is symmetrical, so it was glaringly obviously out of place if you lived there. So they knew the dog would eat them, and is huge. They knew I had a gun, and I even announced I was armed. Yet they returned with backup. They moved stuff I didn't know about until my marine buddy told me to check. As if so much a rock was out of place, it's a way of gauging the person's awareness and presence, I guess. I'm working on a police report and looking at getting some good cameras and motion detectors with lights. It's been two days now without any disturbances, and it's 5.30 a.m. I'm leaving for work and have neighbors watching the house. I have secured my gate and installed a doggy door, too. When I, a 38-year-old female, was 18, I lived in a detached garage apartment that had a second apartment upstairs. My apartment was an efficiency one and only had walls with walkways instead of doors to separate the rooms. The second floor was being renovated and was empty, but at night I would hear footsteps and it sounded like it was coming from upstairs. I could hear someone going up and down the stairs outside at night, and one time I had put my Saint Bernard on a leash to go out to potty and when I went outside, I heard scratching on the steps to find her wrapped around the stairs in a way she wouldn't have done by herself. From that point, I started having friends stay over, because I thought I was imagining things, since it was my first time living alone. One night, I was laying in bed and heard a noise that woke me up. So I looked up, and half awake, I saw a shadowy figure at the foot of my bed. I could see the outline of what looked like a thin man or woman, with shaggy hair and a top hat. I told myself I was just being paranoid and imagining things, and grabbed a hold of my dog and covered us with a blanket, telling myself it wasn't real. 
A few weeks later, my car had a baseball thrown through the window, and when I was out taping it up, my neighbour came out to talk to me. A young couple rented the house on the same lot, and I asked her if she knew if our landlord had either been working on the upstairs unit or had maybe rented it out, because I kept hearing noises. She told me no, and offered to have her husband go take a look upstairs in the unit. While he was inspecting, she started telling me to be aware of a homeless man who was seen in the alley behind us. So I asked her to describe him, and she told me he was tall, thin, dirty, had long hair and was always wearing a funny hat, like the Mad Hatter. Her husband came back then and told me that the door was unlocked, but the floor wasn't finished in the apartment upstairs, so there was no possible way someone could be up there, because there was no place to step. I called my mum and she helped me move, and while I was loading the U-Haul, I found three house keys in random places in my yard. All of them went to my door. I'm pretty sure this dude was just living with me, and I had no idea. A friend of mine had his apartment broken into a few weeks back, and the intruders were looking for my friend's roommate, who had apparently gotten on the wrong side of a drug running group. My friend had had some people over that night, and together they managed to remove the intruders from the apartment, but not without being sprayed with mace. Fast forward to today, and I was helping my friend move out of that apartment and somewhere safer. We were almost done, and were just taking some trash around back to the dumpster, when we saw up on a balcony above the dumpsters that there was a man in his mid-thirties in grease-covered clothing and had a moustache. He looked a bit like if Danny Trejo was a mechanic. As we dumped the trash and turned around, the man called down and told us to smile at the camera. He had his phone pointed at us and was recording. My friend informed me that he was one of the guys that had broken into his apartment, so we kept our heads down as we walked past the balcony. When just as we started around the corner and out of sight, the man raised his voice at us and said, Ignoring me will be bad for your health, boys. We then heard him moving around on the balcony, and it had an attached staircase to the ground near the dumpsters, and we thought he might follow us. We quickly grabbed the last of his stuff and got into our cars, thinking about calling the police, but didn't want to potentially paint a target on our backs for this guy. However, my friend had apparently filed a report about the break-in and mace incident with the police, and has even updated them after he found out they lived in the same building he did. I'm still a bit shaken from the encounter, especially knowing this man has video footage of me. Around 2007, I was getting my PhD at the University of Florida, and I, a 30-year-old female, lived in Gainesville in a condo that I owned by myself. I had a friend who was walking across the United States at the time. We'll call him Captain. Captain decided to spend the winter at my house, so he got a mutual friend to drive him from Alabama, where he had last stopped walking, to my house in Gainesville. We had a pleasant Thanksgiving, and then Captain just kind of chilled at my house for the next several months. It wasn't too big of a deal, because I was mostly staying at my boyfriend's house, but it was a little bit much. When it was time for him to get back to walking, he asked if I could drive him back to the exact location he had left in Alabama. So looking forward to having my house back, I agreed to drive him one day when I was out of school. I don't remember what route we took or where it was, but I remember that the drive wasn't that long relatively speaking. It seemed like it should have been, but I guess it was about five to six hours one way. I dropped him off in the early evening and headed back for Florida, and this meant that I was driving at night, by myself, in an unknown part of the country. Conveniently, the GPS technology that we had at the time gave me this extremely backwards route back to Florida. So to get to where I had dropped off Captain, we stayed on the freeway for most of the time, then it was about 10 miles off the freeway. 
while Google Maps, or whatever the app was, decided that the faster way was to take me on all these little back roads through Alabama backcountry. Serious deliverance vibes. Seriously. So I was already a little freaked out, and was occasionally checking in with my boyfriend to let him know where I was. I've driven at night alone tons of times, but my history with respect to strangers has made me hypervigilant. At some point I became aware that there was a car behind me, but I didn't assume that was anything weird until the car stayed with me for several miles. But again, I just shrugged it off to maybe Google Maps, giving them the same weird route as me. But because I was paying attention to the car behind me, I didn't notice when I pulled through some small town that I was taking a left at the wrong intersection. There were two intersections very close together, and I was accidentally in the left lane to turn left at the intersection before the one I was supposed to turn at. No biggie, I figured. It was about two in the morning. So when the light changed, I drove straight through the intersection and took a left at the next one. The car behind me did the same thing, and I realized at that point that I was definitely being followed. I immediately called my boyfriend and asked him to look up the non-emergency police number for the area where I was and tried to give him my nearest location. But like any dude who has never been the victim of any kind of assault, he thought I was overreacting. He was in the middle of something and therefore didn't look up the number for me. In retrospect, I should have absolutely just called 911, but I didn't want to make a big deal out of something that could have been nothing. However, that nothing was quickly becoming something indeed, because I'd been on the back roads in Alabama without a gas station for a long time, and my car was in need of gas. That meant that I would have to exit the vehicle at a gas station that was probably not well manned at this time of night by myself. I was low-key freaking out, and it didn't help that I couldn't see the driver of the car behind me. It was so dark, and the car had dark-tinted windows. Also, Alabama backward roads are pretty damn dark. I kept looking in the rear mirror, but I couldn't get a glimpse of the driver, and I honestly couldn't figure out why this person had targeted me. At first I had laughed it off as some kind of southern football vendetta, as I had a UF license plate frame, go Gators, and was trying to convince myself that this person was just trying to scare me because they liked one of our rival schools. Given that I am a tall woman though, it may have been difficult to identify that I actually was a woman in the car. But either way, this person was clearly following me, and given that I had to stop my car, I was feeling increasingly at risk. Finally, my backwards route took me into a relatively larger metropolitan area, and I was finally on streets with lights and businesses that were still lit up. I started to feel safer, but I still had to stop for gas. I had already made a plan as far as that was concerned, but I wanted the guy behind me to know that I was onto him. So at the first intersection that was well lit, I turned fully around in my car seat and stared at him whilst pretending to talk on the phone. I did this for the entire time the light was red, and I wanted it to look like I was describing his car and his features to whoever was on the phone. Not long after this, I found a gas station that was well lit up and was driving on fumes, praying that I wouldn't run out of gas in backwards Alabama. I pulled into the gas station so that my driver's side door was adjacent to the door of the gas station, jumped out and ran inside. I let the attendant know that I was being followed, and he walked out from behind the counter and walked to the windows, saying that no one was there. I was sure that the car had been behind me when I pulled into the station, but seeing that I'd run inside, they must have driven off. I still have no idea what the guy's intention was, but he followed me for easily an hour and a half, which was about a hundred miles. It felt predatory as hell. Thankfully, I was able to gas up my car under the watchful eye of the gas station attendant, and the attendant told me the quickest way to the freeway. My trip was uneventful after that, but I was still shaking and thoroughly pissed at my boyfriend for not taking me seriously. Stay safe out there.
I've never really had anything like this happen before, so I'm not sure if perhaps I'm overthinking it. I'm a relatively short girl, which is why I didn't even want to go out and see if it was just a matter of the guy wanting to personally hand over the food. But yesterday, at around 5am, my girlfriend had ordered me some DoorDash. We always put the leave at door option, especially when it's in the morning, so it just turns into a matter of waiting for the dasher to leave. However, the guy I got yesterday scared the hell out of me. We had gotten a DoorDash notification that the food was dropped off and ready for pickup. I was just about to walk out when I noticed that he was just standing there, not on his phone, not trying to see if he was at the right house, nothing, just standing there. I was a bit confused so I told my girlfriend and asked if she had put the leave at door option, and she had. We waited a bit before she decided she'd called to remind him to just leave it there, but he never answered. He actually ignored every call, every text, and he even hung up on her. It wasn't even a matter of him wanting to steal my food, because if that were the case he would have just driven off. He spent a while waiting, and at one point I almost went out when I no longer saw him, but I realised that he was just in his car across the street, waiting. He hadn't even left the food on the fence, just taken it with him while he waited in his car. He even drove off angrily, almost like he was upset that I hadn't gone out to see him. That was around the same time that he hung up on my girlfriend, and both times that he waited, outside the fence and in his car, lasted around 10 to 15 minutes, but I have no doubt that something was up with that guy. We also later realised that this guy hadn't even uploaded the picture of the food trying to be delivered. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.